So let's begin. First, I'm gonna share my screen and take you right to the Quarkus main website. So in case you're unfamiliar with Quarkus, let me tell you just a little bit about it. Quarkus is the original Kube native Java stack. And there's two attributes that I think of that make it really special for using in a Kube scenario. The first one is, a true developer joy experience. And by that, I mean, it is super easy to build, create and deploy against Kubernetes. And the second aspect is a cloud container first runtime. So we call it a build time runtime. And the basic idea is to build your applications, tailor them specifically to a container image so that they start in incredibly fast times with incredibly small footprint. And you can see that in action. If you scroll down at the bottom, you can see some charts we have. And if you look, you can see the Quarkus footprint is in the like low tens of megs when we're running in native. And in Java, it's a fraction of the size of a typical traditional cloud native stack. On the startup time, you'll see incredible startup time in the milliseconds for native and sub-second for Java. And what these attributes combined together allow you to do is to quickly respond to load in the cloud so that Kubernetes can easily scale up and create additional pods and they're available immediately to handle that traffic right away before you experience a delay. This is incredibly important if you are also in a serverless or function setting because there you're dealing with small instances where cold starts are frequent. And when a cold start occurs, that cost is appended to the request and therefore that imp impacts to the end user's experience, which we want to be positive. So using Quarkus, you can help address that. Now, normally what I would suggest is that you could click the start coding button at the top right corner of the screen. And this would let you pick your extensions that you could use and it'll generate a project for you that you could download or create it on GitHub. However, since I'm gonna be using a pre-release version of Quarkus, because I wanna show you some cool new stuff in Quarkus 2, I'm gonna click this and do it the command line way. Now there's a certain set of things that you need to use Quarkus. You only need an editor, whatever editor you want, whatever ID you want, doesn't matter. You need Java and you need a build system that can either be Gradle or it could be Maven. In my case, I'm gonna be using Maven. So I'm gonna click read this guide and this is gonna be a guide that's gonna walk us through creating our first application. Now, I know what I'm doing, so I'm just gonna go ahead and cut and paste this one block right here and I'm gonna modify it to refer to Quarkus 2. So let's go ahead and edit this real quick. And the second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna specify a custom list of extensions. What I would like to do is I would like to include our latest REST framework that allows you to have ultimate high performance by using a custom build time generated web routing framework. And so let's see here. And what that will do is that means that it's gonna run it reactive to the core but yet your code can either be imperative or reactive. So whichever programming style you like, and if it's reactive, it's gonna inline it straight in the engine for ultimate performance. And then if you do a blocking style imperative way of developing um, for say usability reasons, then that code will run in a dedicated worker and it will be kicked off and ran in a very high performance way so that it comes right back to, to the, uh, the reactive engine and runs efficiently. So I'm just gonna say equals uh, rest easy reactive. And I do want uh, JSON ability as well. So I'm gonna say rest easy reactive Jackson to include the Jackson framework for JSON processing. Now, as I mentioned, you can use any ID and that is because Quarkus does not do um, everything through IDE plugins. It's, they're not required. Instead, it presents itself as a standard plain Java project, which means you get the same experience no matter what environment you use. And it actually does all of its intelligence and smart logic inside a Java process. So I'm gonna use VS Code in my case, and I'm just gonna type code in the directory, and this is gonna launch things up and it's gonna do the normal setup type stuff. So this is a Java project, so I'm gonna say yes to that. And then I'm gonna skip out everything else and just close out these initial getting started windows. Now, the very first thing you want to do when you start your project in an IDE is you wanna go into this terminal window and say new terminal. And I'm going to run a special command, MVN Quarkus Dev. And this is gonna launch our live coding experience. One of the great things about Quarkus is you can run your application, edit it live and see the changes immediately without having to shut everything down, rebuild, recompile, go grab a cup of coffee, come back and try again. Um, so this saves you a ton of time. So let's look at what was generated for us. If I go into our Java directory, we can see that a simple resource was created for me automatically. And it is listening at slash hello for like a hello world kind of example. It also created a test for me, which is doing a rest assured style of test. 
And that is going to send an HTTP request on slash hello, and it's going to expect a 200 for a successful response. So I'm going to go back to the resource and let's just go ahead and see what that looks like right now. So if I do localhost 8080 and I do slash hello, I'm going to see hello rest easy reactive. Okay, well, let's change this message um, so I can show you live coding in action. So I could just say hello, J4K, and uh, we'll do some exclamation marks. And then once I make that change, it's going to happen. It's going to happen live immediately. And you can see I just refreshed the browser and now it says hello, J4K. Now you saw an error occur in the console. Like, okay, wait a minute, what went wrong? Nothing went wrong. This is our live continuous testing, which is new in Quarkus 2. And this is a great feature. So check it out. You can see I'm getting an error message now because I just changed the message, but I did not update my test. So hello, rest easy reactive <laughs> does not match. Uh, hello j4k so no problem let it let's fix our test we're just going to say hello j4k and then this is going to happen live it's going to make the change immediately run the test and as you can see it's under half a second 408 milliseconds to be precise and it's verified that now that is correct now this capability is very powerful and it's very intelligent it knows exactly which code has changed and which tests to run that are respective to that code and because of this, I can do new things like I can do pure test driven development. So as you know, with test driven development, the philosophy is that you, um, you write your tests before you write your code, really simple. And that makes you think about the contract of your routine and not just the implementation, which can sometimes interfere with your contract, right? So we wanna think about the input, the output, the validation, error messages, and so on. So I'm gonna do a very simple example. I'm just gonna do a multiply example. And that's going to uh, send a request to multiply. And I need to send some parameters to multiply. So I'm going to say, let's see, um, dot query param. And I'll call the first parameter um, num1. And the second parameter is going to be, or sorry, the value we're going to use is 40. Um, actually, I could just fix up this white space because it's annoying. And then we'll cut and paste this line again. And we'll change the second parameter is going to be uh, 50. So 40 times 50, super easy. We'll expect a response of uh, 2000. Okay. So as you saw me editing in the bottom, I was, the tests were continually running and it's failing still. And the reason it's failing is because it's getting a 404 because we haven't written our code yet. So let's write our code. Well, easiest way to do that is just duplicate the getting started resource that's created for you. So I'm just going to say, um, multiply resource. And then I just need to do a few changes. I want to listen on the multiply URL. Oops, there you go. And I also need to fix my class so that it's actually the correctly named. And then I need to change the signature to match what I expect to do. So in my operation, I'm going to return an integer. Um, it's going to be called multiply. And it's going to take uh, a number and one and a number two. Now, since this is... Um, we're using REST easy, we need to say how we're going to get these values. Where is it going to come from? Well, we want it to come from the query stream because that's what our test is passing in. So to do that, we just say at uh, query, let's see if it's, sometimes the tag completion is a little slow to start. Okay. Then we say num1, and then we'll do the same thing here for our second number. And that pretty much concludes our signature. We just need to return the correct value. So as you can see, our test is still failing with compile errors. It'll actually print the compile errors right in the, in the console. And then if, if you're doing live coding, you'll see them in the browser as well. So we'll say num1 times num2, and that should give us a correct answer. Let's see if we got everything right. Both our tests are passing, but look, only one test was run because this is that intelligent capability I was talking about. It's figuring out that only the multiply resource was changed. Therefore, only the multiply test needs to be ran. And it did that in under half a second. Okay, well, let's do um, something a little bit more complicated. Let's do some validation. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to um, copy this test and we're going to, we'll call this a divide endpoint. And one of the things about, you know, divide it, we'll, here, let's just invert this real quick. So we'll say 2000 divided by 40 and we're going to want, sorry, divided by 50, we want 40 is the answer. Uh, the thing with divide, dividing is you have to worry about dividing by zero, right? So if the second parameter is zero, we'll get a failure or we should expect a failure anyway. So I'm just going to change this to say by zero and um, we're not going to expect a body and we're not going to expect a successful response. We're going to expect a, a 400 bad request. We don't want a server error. We don't want it to blow up our server. We want it to return a failed response. So as you can see, we're seeing two tests failed uh, for the same reason, 404. We have not implemented this yet. Oh, actually, it was a 400 because I didn't change the... Uh, this, is, this is a great thing. If you make a mistake, you just keep editing and you don't have to disrupt your flow. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to 
this and make another copy. We're going to implement our logic. So it's going to be called divide resource. And so it's going to look really similar to our multiply. Uh, we're just going to rename this method name. And then we'll fix our class. And then, um, you know, pretty much the logic is or the, everything's the same, except we got to change our logic. So I'm just going to change this from a multiply to divide and we're done. We've, we've implemented our, our, um, our divide version. Although, as you can see, there's a test that failed because I messed up and I forgot to add the validation, right? So now we know we need to do that because our testing to our live testing told us. And so I'm just going to say, if number two is equal to zero, um, then we need a, a bad request. So we'll say throw new bad um, request exception. And we're going to do a response, a custom response. It's going to be a status code of bad request. And then we got to build it because it's a builder pattern on response objects. And then we add our semicolon and we should be good to go. And as you can see, both tests were passing and the other tests for the other services we wrote, the multiply and the greeting, those were not run um, because they weren't needed. Okay, so now, um, okay, you may think, oh, that's kind of cool, but that's just HTTP. So let's do more. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and throw in data to the mix, right? So to do that, really cool about Quarkus, not only can you make live code changes, you can make um, live um, technology changes. So I'm going to say uh, Quarkus add extension, and I'm going to specify my extensions to be, I would like Hibernate, which is the, the de facto object relational mapping layer for mapping objects into our database. And I'm going to use the Quarkus Panache extensions, which makes it even easier, less code, it gets rid of the boilerplate, allows you to use active record patterns and things like that. And I need a database, so I'm going to use Postgres, so I'll use a uh, JDBC Postgres driver. And I also need, um, I'm going to be doing some container stuff in a second, so I'm going to say container image jib, I can type. And then I'm going to say mini kube, because I'm running Kubernetes locally on my laptop today. And then once I run this, this is going to uh, modify our POM and add our new extensions, which you can see we got the green check mark, so we're good to go there. The first thing you want to do when you do that is you want to right click on your POM and update your projects, because otherwise you won't get your annotations and your tab complete and your class path and all that kind of stuff. It'll report errors you don't want. And the next thing I want to do is I would like Hibernate to create the tables for me. So one of the things the scaffolding generated for us is this application properties file. And here I can just simply add a single setting um, and it's called ORM database generation. And it's going to do a drop and create. And what the drop and create does is it just gets rid of tables if they already exist and creates them um, new fresh again, um, which is really great for a development setting. Okay, so let's take a look and see what's happened. If I go back to the Java process and scroll back, you can see these uh, Docker commands happening. So Okay, what happened? If you notice, I did not create a database. I did not start a Docker instance for the database. I didn't do anything. I didn't even specify where to talk to the database. It's completely empty except for that one Hibernate property. And this is a really cool feature we have also called Dev Services that's in Quarkus 2. And what Dev Services does is it says, it realizes, hmm, they haven't configured a database and there is a JDBC driver installed and it's the Postgres driver. They must want Postgres. So it creates a Postgres instance custom for you on the fly. And now you can just start coding. You don't have to think about setting all this stuff up. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a, uh, we'll call it fruit. Let's do a simple fruit example. And um, as you know, if you haven't used entities before, the thing that you do is you just mark it with an annotation, um, say entity. And then um, since we're using panache extensions, which is going to give us some cool extra methods, I'm going to say extends uh, panache entity. Now, once I do that, it's also going to change the rules. I don't have to worry about things I normally would. I don't have to create an ID. I don't have to annotate that. I don't have to create a bunch of accessors. I can just use simple fields so that our entity stays tiny. So I'll say string name, and that's it. There is our entity. Now we need to manipulate it. So let's create a resource. So I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this resource. And this is going to be called fruit resource. Okay. And now the fruit resource is going to work off of a direct, off of a URL called slash fruits. And I'm using hibernate um, classic here and not hibernate reactive. So I'm going to do an imperative style for this. So I'm going to go ahead and rename it. And I'm going to say um, at blocking. Now, if you worry about, don't worry about forgetting this, because if you forget to specify this, it'll actually tell you when you go and you um, actually refresh the page, it'll say, hey, you didn't, you didn't specify blocking because it's smart enough to know when you're creating threads or not. Okay. And so we want to import that. And 
Now we don't want text plane. We want to actually do a complex structure. Earlier I set up Jackson. So we're going to do um, application JSON for that. And then we need to change our signature because we're going to return a list and it's going to be a list of fruit. And that is going to, uh, well, we should name it something nice like fruits. And that should be it. Now we just need to return it. So this is what's really cool about Panache is I can say fruit.list all. I don't have to actually, well, I could do list, but I'm going to do list all because I just want everything to the screen. Um, and the nice thing about this, I don't have to write a query. I don't have to construct an ET manager. I don't need to inject anything. It's all just good to go. So that's our read. Let's do the right side of things. So I'm just going to copy this and I, I'm going to change the get here to post. And then um, we don't want to produce. We want to consume because we're taking it as input. So, and then the next thing we want to do is change our method signature. So there's not gonna be a return value. We'll call this create. You don't have to, we could have kept the same name if we wanted, but I like it better this way. And then um, so likewise, as we did it with our read, we just need one simple method parameter. We just say uh, persist, and then we're gonna say fruit. And that's it. So this is all the logic that we need to implement everything we need for a database. So let's see if that's working. So I just go to fruits. Oh, and I need to refresh. Did I, did I type with that? Oh yeah, look at that. I put hello in front, oops. Uh, there we go. Okay, so there you go. So you can see there's no results right away. Um, no problem, let's go ahead and uh, create some records. So I'm just gonna say HTTP localhost and I wanna go to fruits and I don't know, we'll create an apple and um, let's do a pear. And how about an orange? Why not? Okay. So now if I hit refresh in the browser, you can see those records now exist, did all the work for us. So there you go, so that's the magic. Now, this can even be connected to testing. So uh, since we're, I don't have a ton of time because I have so much to cover, I'm gonna do a real super basic test. I'm just gonna say test fruits. And um, we don't care about the parameters. We are just gonna look at the URL and we're gonna expect a 200 response. Uh, and then I need to enable I don't think I enabled testing. So we're gonna enable testing and it's gonna run for that. And then what I wanna do is I wanna show you how even normally you would think of it as well, if I just change the test, it's gonna know that it's changing the test. But I was actually changing the resources before and there's no code leakage there that's simply just doing an HTTP request. So what I can do is I can do a very similar thing. I can come over here and I can say in my entity, I can say public string and I can add another field, we'll say description. And this will actually modify the database, create the whole record, run the test. And look, it's only running one test because it knows uh, that only there's only one entity thing in here. And so this is ran in only 723 milliseconds. So as you can see, everything about Quarkus is fast. Your workflow is fast, your code is fast, your execution, your runtime is fast. Now let's take this to the next step. We want to run this in production. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kill off our process and we need to configure things for a staging database because we don't want to create one. We want to use the, the one that already exists. So I'm going to run one locally. So I'm just going to, you just need, I just need three settings. I need the URL, localhost, I need the username, and I need the password. And that is it. Okay, so let's go ahead and build. Oh, oh you know what I should do is I should actually start the database first because um, I didn't leave it running. There we go. That's going to start our instance. It's just a simple Docker run command. Um, and then to actually do our native compilation, we're going to just do dash D native. That's it. Then you do clean package, although we probably should skip test just to make it a little bit faster. And we'll say clean package. And this is going to start building. And now while this is going, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's happening under the hood. Okay. So what I was talking about at the start of our session was kind of the goals and what Quarkus does for you. Well, the thing to think about is that Java was not designed for the cloud. Java was originally designed to be these long running dynamic processes that shared lots and lots of code. So you would have typically have like a monolith runtime using gigs of memory, and then you would have multiple applications running. In those applications, you'd have your view layer, you'd have your business logic, you'd have your persistence layer, you'd have all kinds of stuff all running in the same system, you know, hundreds and hundreds of jars. And that was how we built apps. And we were happy with that, right? Running on bare metal systems. Well, with the advent of Kubernetes in the cloud, things are different. Now we have an orchestrator in the mix that can spin up elastically, consuming resources only when we need it, when load patterns increase. And so the need is to be able to take 
and run the same, what would make up the same application into many different services and many instances of those services that can scale up and down. And when you do that, that means that the base overhead of your application is multiplied times the number of these services that you need, right? So we, that's just too expensive with Java, right? It needs to be much simpler and much smaller. And that's what Corpus is all about. So this problem gets even worse when you look at it from a serverless and a function setting, because then you're talking an app could be broken into something like 200 instances of live functions. And that is a lot to pay a huge startup and initialization cost for. I'll talk a little bit more about how Corcus helps with that. But, but what I've been telling you is that in the same space that you could run you know, a few Java processes for running a traditional cloud stack, you could actually run many Corcus instances and not, the system will not break a sweat. It will handle all this load just fine. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have an intelligent build time core, which provides common capabilities, and then an extension layer so that any, you could write an extension if you want to. These extensions are experts in a particular technology. And what these, these expert extensions do is they look at your application, they analyze your application, they figure out what you're doing, and they build an output that is tailored to what your application and only what your application is doing, right? And this tailored output benefits both Open JDK running in a standard traditional Java VM and running a native compilation. Now, how does it do that? Simple. First step, compile your application. Second step, optimize your dependencies through provisioning. And the third step, generate wiring custom code for your application, which leads to these optimal outputs. Now, let me show you why that's important. Okay, let's look at what the native compiler does. When you use the Graal VM native compiler, it takes your application classes, it takes the JDK classes, it compiles them all together, figures out what is needed, and optimizes them doing things like inlining and so on to produce a really tiny executable. That's its goal anyway. It's designed to work off of procedural program. The problem is in Java with modern frameworks, we don't write things in procedural ways. Instead, we do things in a way more productive way where we use a declarative model with inversion of control and, and detyping and things like that. And so what you'll end up with is you'll end up with an injection point. You'll say add inject foo and you and the compiler doesn't know where foo comes from, right? So what most Java frameworks will do when they add native support is they basically just register everything because all these decisions are made at runtime. Well, that's too late. So what Corcus does is it does it all at build time and it helps the native compiler by generating wiring code that shows the connections between all these different pieces. So when I showed you this graph before, these lines here, Corcus fills those in for the Graal VM native compiler. So in this case, I've got shopping cart one and I've got shopping cart two. Shopping cart two is not needed. And the compiler knows that because Corcus generated a class that was a wiring class that defined how shopping cart one relates to the other class. And this is how you end up with the smallest possible executables and the highest density running in the cloud. Okay, so our executable has finished. So let's take a look at that. Um, so what I'm gonna do just clear out my console real quick. I just have to go into the target directory and in there is a getting started snapshot runner, right? So this just goes off of the, um, the version tag that we put when we created the project, we could have changed that to something else. And then when I start it, it's gonna start immediately. And just to show you that, just in case there's a video lay, I mean, it is like, it's instant. The second that you start, it's done. So that's like the request came in to Coop, it started an instance, it ran, we're ready to process load immediately. All right, well, let's see that working. Um, so, so if I go to fruits, I can see it's currently empty because now we're in staging. We're not using, um, you know, we're not using our test database. And actually, you know, I didn't, one thing I didn't mention is in the properties file, uh, you probably are wondering what's this percent prod here. What this specifies is the production settings. So this means these settings will not take effect unless you're running in production. That way you don't have to keep changing your config file or switching them around. You just leave it all in there and then it'll switch to the appropriate one. Okay, so it, it's running, but we don't have any, any data yet. So um, where did I put that? I think it's here. Okay, so let's go ahead and create some stuff. We'll create an apple and we'll create an orange. And then if I hit refresh, you can see the apple and the orange are there. So this is, this is live and let's look and see how much memory are we using? So if I say PSEO, the PID of the process, RSS stands for resident set size. This is the accurate way to measure memory. And then um, search for args. And then what we see is our getting started process is using only 36 megabytes of memory. And this is with an active non-garbage collected heap. So there's data in here that could be cleaned out and then it would be even smaller. But even so, 36 is tiny. Just think of how many services you could run with only using 36 megs, megs of memory for your microservice. Okay, great. So we've shown running in native now. Now let's take a look at moving to Minikube because we don't wanna do this just, um, you know, just in this local setting. So to do that, what I'm going to do is 
I need to do one little thing. When you switch between Docker and Minikube, Kube, you want to change your environment. This is just a Minikube thing. Um, maybe we'll do this for you at some point. <laughs> but you say uh, Minikube Docker env, and then it will print out what command you should run because you have to do an eval that inlines it in the shell. So there. And once we do that, we're set to do to let Corcus uh, create our Kube instance for us. So what we're going to do is we're just going to um, do our same Maven clean package, but we're going to add two parameters. One parameter we're going to add is container image build equals true. And what that's going to do is that's going to create a container for us. And the next one we're going to add is Kubernetes deploy, which is going to deploy it um, live in our local Minikube instance that I have on running on my laptop. Now, what you're going to see when this happens is it's going to, one of the things it's doing is it's going to generate a bunch of metadata for Kubernetes that normally you would have to author yourself. So let's take a quick look at that. If I go into target and I go into Kubernetes, I can then go into the Kubernetes YAML and you can see there's a service definition that's defined here. Um, we've got our deployment defined for, with our application, and then we've got some labels that are set and so on. So you don't have to like grab a bunch of books and look up how to specify all this kind of stuff. This is all just done for you by Quarkus. And this is what makes it really easy just to get going. And you don't have to know a ton of stuff. You can just produce these uh, really nice applications. Okay, so let's take a look and see and see what's where it's running. So when you have Minikube running locally, the command is Minikube um, service list. And what that's gonna do is show us what our running services are. And you can see getting started is running on this location. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that. And I'm gonna go to the fruits URL again. And, oh. Can I typo that? Sorry about that. There he goes. What am I doing wrong here? Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> this is the fun of live demos and sometimes things don't always go right. Uh, connection refused. So let me go ahead and do, I'm just gonna, one last try. I'm gonna clean out real quick our Minikube example. So I'm, I'm only gonna have limited time. So if, worst case, this does not work. I promise I will show you guys a, second example of this. So let's go ahead. I'll post like a YouTube video or something like that. Hopefully I can get it working though. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on in my system here, guys. Sorry about that. Um, let me just go ahead and show you, though, what it would look like had it deployed successfully. So you can see it's currently running. So it is actually there. Um, oh, we do have a failure. All right, let's take a look at the pod real quick. Uh, deployment. This one is pod status. Oh. That's what I did wrong. Okay. Okay, guys, I made a mistake here. I'm really sorry about that. I forgot to point this to, I'm running at the wrong database. This is trying to bind to localhost on our local port. And what we really want to do is we want to point to our, uh, our database that's running on the Kube cluster. That was a really stupid mistake. Okay, so here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. And then real quick, I'm just going to rebuild...
and hope you don't mind. I'm, if I, uh, <laughs> I just want to show this working correctly. Hope you don't mind if I cut into questions a little bit, guys. And then I promise I will I'll answer them on the chat. Okay, so hurry up. <laughs> oh, yes, I got to clean up. Yeah, so basically what happened is um, it still had my service deployed, my Kubernetes service deployed, and my deployment was deployed. I had a wrong configuration. It's trying to talk to a database that doesn't exist. It was failing the health checks, so the service wasn't starting. Um, so with that, I am going to, um, yeah, I, I know we're getting close to the hard start, hard start, hard stop. This should be finished in just one second. Um, da, da, da. Okay, excellent. Okay, now we're deployed. Now let's try and do this correctly. Okay. There we go. All right, there's our, our fruits working correctly now. And I can then, <laughs> finally, I can create some records. I'll try to do it super fast. Uh, okay, so we'll create an orange and an apple. Okay, hit refresh. Oh, I mean, I mean am I not pointing at the right instance here? Uh, let's go back here. Sorry, my flow got a little bit disrupted. I need to actually go to the correct service. Okay, sorry about that, guys. And here we go. We've created the two entries, so this is working cor correctly. It's actually running on Kube, and it is actually really easy if you don't make a really bad mistake, like put, specify the wrong database thing that I, that I did. Okay, so just real, real quick to recap what I showed you. I showed you how you can go from nothing from scratch. You can really quickly create an application by using live coding. You can really quickly monitor the test results of this by using live continuous testing. You can take that, produce it to an efficient native by, uh, by using our native compilation feature and just a few parameters, and finally, you could deploy to Kubernetes. So... Um, I am finally available <laughs> to answer. Probably only have time for one question, but I promise to answer the rest in the chat. Okay, so the question is, if I use a REST service, as you show within AWS, can I still use Panache to access, for example, a Dynamo DB service? Yes, so basically Panache is a layer on top of Hibernate. So anything that, that Hibernate can talk to, um, Panache can, can modify for that. Um, so basically, as long as you have a database that implements, that has a, a working JDBC driver, which Hibernate can then use, then you can incorporate that with, within Corcus. Now we do need a Corcus extension for the JDBC drivers. Um, I believe we do have a working um, Dynamo extension um, that, that is available. And um, there's a question about um, good online uh, online resources for Corcus. Well, you can get those, um, you can go to our main Corcus.io website. So I can show you that really quickly. And um, let's say Corcus IO. And right on the main website, there is a guides section. And then there's tons of content on anything you want to do. And then we also have a really cool video show that we do um, every week called Corcus Insights. And you may want to watch that and tune in and see, um, you know, a bit about what's going on in the Corcus community. Okay, so I think we might be done with questions. Does anybody have any other questions you'd like to ask? Okay, in that case, I want to thank you guys for your time, and I hope that uh, that for your next project, you consider using Quarkus. And once again, apologies for my mess up at the end there. Um, I think I just uh, had a bit of a brain oversight there, but I, I hope you did get to see the experience and how easy and quickly it is to quickly build your application and carry it all the way for, forward to running on Kubernetes and also running in local containers as well. And so thank you and have a great day. <laughs>